Okay. Now we're on. All right, so now we've got Hugh Blennings giving us a talk, Why No Foss on Stage Right. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you. Now, I've just noticed that you're actually missing the bottom of the slides. So despite having attended part of the speaking briefing where they say, make sure you're not using the 10% around the edge. There's actually a whole bunch of text at the bottom there. So I think, right, give, sorry? Make it smaller. Nice, it might work. I apologise. It's. As you'll see, there's actually a certain irony to some of the things I'll be talking about that uh, this particular multimeter experience is proving to be anything less than straightforward. Is there an HDMI input rather than yeah, there is. So let's just try that. Sorry. I've got to get to the app first. Are you extending or mirroring the light? Extending at this stage, but I'm about to give up and mirror. Awesome. If you go. Awesome. If you go Take your mouse to that. Click, click option when you click on scales. Yep, it's right. I'll, yep. No. <laughs> um, if you go back, just. Yep. If you click on. I actually remember enough of the talk that I shall, I shall leave this section to the someone who's actually capable, with hardware, unlike me. Um, so what I, want, what I just wanted to talk about today, is, this is unfortunately one of these talks where it's mostly going to be questions rather than solutions. Um, I was engaged in a conversation on the Linux Australia mailing list recently about choice of desktop tools, and this is in the context of um, some more day-to-day -day applications. But one of the things I observed is for a lot of the, lot of the work I do day-to-day, -day, I actually end up running OS X and don't necessarily use um, some free software tools anywhere near as much as I'd like. The reasoning for that is one of my favourite pastimes outside free software is actually um, playing live, playing and performing live music. And um, what I came to there on it is I've ended up using a lot of uh, tools on a Mac in order to, to do that. And the organisers of the mini conference sensed an opportunity and said, well, would you like to come along and talk about that at the, uh, the mini conference? Here, here I am. Um, well, hopefully soon will be. Um, so just by way of a little, a little bit more background, hopefully, awesome, that's close enough, let's just run with that, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so I kind of lost a bet. Um, from a music perspective, I, um, I've been playing keyboards since the late 80s, mostly synthesizer, digital piano, that sort of thing, self-taught. I'm involved in a range of, um, a range of projects, mostly uh, bands, but do a little bit of recording with friends. But I've also had a lot of uh, long-term involvement in Linux and free, free and open source uh, software. My traditional keyboard rig, bearing in mind I'm basically using this on, on stage, um, one of the key things you need for modern, any sort of modern rock kind of stuff is a pretty nice wide range of sounds. I'm playing live, so I'm not playing sequenced materials, which is, um, which will become relevant in a couple of slides, slides time. I started off with a fairly, what's a fairly conventional uh, rig for a, a modern keyboardist, I guess a, a couple of keyboards, a, more, a Korg M3, and the Yamaha P155 digital piano. They're really, really nice sounding bits of gear, but they, of course the only way you can uh, improve on them is to upgrade the manufacturers like that. You, you spend another three or four grand, you've got another, another keyboard, but it, it ends up being a bit of a, um, a, bit of a closed shop in that regard. So around this time, I started experimenting with, um, with virtual instruments in a, in a Mac environment. For those of you that, that aren't familiar with them, just to elaborate a little bit on, on virtual instruments, they're basically software-defined uh, instruments where the sound's produced through DSP-style algorithms. The main difference being it's being done in real time, so uh, optimization becomes quite important. They tend to fall broadly into three different categories. You've got uh, virtual instruments that are simulating, modeling, or recreating a real instrument, so uh, an actual acoustic piano as an example, uh, something like an old Hammond organ, uh, Keith Emerson, John Lord, people like that come to mind. 
uh, an actual synthesizer, something like a Moog Mini Moog. I'm presenting the T-shirt today, and that's the circuit diagram of the ladder filter, if you tilt it on its side. Or increasingly, um, with the virtual instruments, they're an entirely new style of instrument, so they're not actually pretending to be another kind of instrument or another kind of synthesizer even. even. They're, they are their own thing. And uh, spectros spectrosonics on the sphere is probably the, the um, peak of the peak of those. Then last but no, no means least, you have sample-based instruments. So these are instruments where they've actually sampled an acoustic instrument, a piano, a violin, whatever it may be, and they provide the software that gives you an ability to play that back in real time. Uh, in live. The epiphany I had is actually all my hardware synths, having grown up with a background where your synthesizer was actually a physical piece of hardware, they're actually just embedded systems these days. So I had this sort of mindset of, well, I don't want to take a computer on stage because it will break. Well, actually, all the computers, I'm, all the keyboards I'm playing are actually embedded systems. As it turns out, uh, the Core Game 3 does actually run Linux in its behind the, scene, behind the scenes. Their current flagship, the Kronos, um, also runs Linux, you can tell, because it takes two and a half minutes to boot. Um, <laughs> it sounds awesome, but you've got, to sit, you've got to sit there while the guitarist and bass player and everyone else is going, come on, man. Um, the Yamaha, X, Yamaha also use embed, uh, Linux, embedded Linux in, um, in their modern systems. And you've got, uh, I guess, kind of corner case instruments like the Muse Research Receptor, which is a particularly interesting piece of gear. It's rack mount. It's basically an embedded PC, literally. And they use this um, incredibly stable combination of a real-time Linux kernel, Wine, and a whole bunch of other stuff to actually allow you to play Windows-based VSTs through their hardware. Works really, really nicely, but they've got a, a devil of a time to actually keep that up to date. I digress slightly. So this all got me thinking, well, where do, where do, what if I just actually take a Mac and use it as, a, as an embedded system? That sort of kicked the, kicked the journey off from there. So the Mac-based live rig I use at the moment basically looks like this. I, I shan't insult your intelligence by reading every single line on the slide, but it's basically a Mac Mini with a bunch of supporting hardware to connect to my MIDI keyboards um, and the, on the audio side, the outside world. There's a flip, flip to the next page. You can see there the, um, two, the two keyboards, the rack down the bottom, not the best of photo switch, I apologise stuck together with quite a lot of gaffer tape and, uh, and other things. There's a, a Mac Mini sitting in there, a couple of audio interfaces, touch screen top right, and then a, um, a keyboard and mouse, because invariably you do need to type something at some point, no matter how cleverly you try and script, script things. One of the other aspects of the system I should point out too, or I guess one of the tensions as a, as a live player is you want to be able to set up quickly, so I'll, I'll put a reasonable amount of time into trying to make it as compact and as efficient to set up as possible. On the software side, um, excuse me, when I first looked at this, unfortunately I didn't have a great deal of joy with uh, free and open source software. And one of, the, one of the decisions I took consciously at that time was that when I'm in, I suppose, musician mode, I actually just want it to work. I've the May, there's that fleeting moment of inspiration or a pressing deadline for whatever whatever it might be for a gig. So I kind of took a conscious decision despite using free software so heavily everywhere else. And what I did for this, I'm just going to go down the the, um, the proprietary or the non-free path for this particular this particular activity. I used some software by Apple called Mainstage. It's the, the overall host application. I've got a, a slide in a moment which will show that. But it's basically the, the main main piece of software I'm interacting with and then a number of virtual instruments that actually provide the, the sounds on the um, on the inside. The reason I was able to, I've been able to keep it reasonably stable is I've treated this as a, as a dedicated system. So that is to say, I'm not using it as a general purpose computer. I'm not checking my email. I don't let the software automatically update itself. I try and keep it fairly stable and touch wood that up until recently had proven quite a good way to go. So this is a screenshot. Um, this particular shot uh, is a setup I'm using for a musical I'm involved with later in the year. Um, one of the nice things about the, the, uh, this particular environment is you, got, you get a lot of flexibility in terms of the way you define your user interface. I've got a bunch of sliders there to adjust volumes. I've got some notes so that I remember what I'm doing, what I'm playing, those sorts of things. And then up on the right you can see what uh, look like reasonably cryptic names, but they're the different, different songs or different, um, different parts of the show. And I guess to give a little bit more context, if I look at if we look at the first song in the in this particular um, particular show, 
it's a bit of piano down here and then some organ on top and then I can press a single button and it completely changes the, the configuration for say later in the show we're playing that classic by Europe from uh, back in the 80s called the final countdown where you've got big, big sort of trumpet sounds and a whole, whole different set of uh, different sounds immediately available to me and also because I'm prone to get up there and go what the hell is the next chord and I don't sight read so um, the way I've configured the configured things give myself a bit of a cheat sheet around what chords I'm going to play the different verses and, and so forth. So the good of the rig, it's very very flexible it kind of got me out of the um, I need to, well, I need, I want to buy new hardware because there's something shiny cycle a little bit, it becomes a relatively cheaper exercise. Thank you. Um, sounds really, really good. Buying new virtual instruments is considerably cheaper than buying um, new hardware and arguably, I guess, better, better environmentally. Seamless sound changes, so as you flick, as we're sort of going through either different songs in the band or different uh, aspects of the musical, I can change from one set of sounds to the other without it cutting off, which is not a given in, in hardware synths. The ergonomics are really, really nice. I can configure that to be set up however, however I might like, and I can have the chord charts as you saw in the previous show. What's not so good? Well, it's proprietary. That kind of still irks me a little bit from a philosophical standpoint. And the thing that's been particularly frustrating is that the latest versions of some of the software end up being quite buggy and main stage, which is kind of the core of it all, now has a nasty tendency to do things like it'll stick, you'll have a, it'll um, forget MIDI events as far as I can tell. So I'll be playing away and discover I have a stuck note. A miss, yeah, a missed note off. And that's actually quite embarrassing, particularly if you're, if you're in a stage, stage environment. The other aspect of it is, and this would be familiar I guess almost from the old days of um, traditional computing is that this, some of the software ends up being semi-abandonware. So uh, under OS 10 they've recently done the transition from thir generally 32-bit environment to a mostly 64-bit environment and some of the s pieces of software I had, they've just had not, not provided an updated version. You can get shim applications that do sort of allow you to run it but invariably they're buggy or they're not, um, not very performant. So I've had more than my share of moments recently where I thought, Man, I wish I had the source code for this, or I could get in there a little bit more, uh, a little bit more deeply. So, in terms of the, the um, some opportunities, I think we have with for free software in this environment. Virtual instruments is sort of the obvious one because that's the thing we all we all hear. It's the it's the, perhaps the most visible part of it, and they are just big chunks of tightly optimized digital signal processing code. Well, so how how hard can that be? Well, it turns out it's very. These, um, these are enormously complicated models that, um, that they're using. So if we take the example, one of the instruments I use is a virtual simulation of a Moog Mini Moog. They actually go to the trouble of actually modelling the, 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 um, the way the synthesizer operates or the circuitry that operates down to the transistor and components of level. So these are enormously complicated numerical models that are being ex executed in real time with all the attendant CPU optimization necessary to actually, so it's pretty hard for us, I think, as a, as a software community to develop the same sort of resources that we might otherwise be to bring these to, to bear. A further complication is that in other kinds of um, instruments, uh, there's these enormous sample libraries, so you quite often have gigabytes and gigabytes of very carefully um, curated and crafted samples that have been pulled together. As I so said they're slightly tongue-in-cheek, it's probably pretty hard for us to get access to $150,000 worth of Yamaha acoustic piano and spend the time sampling it and doing all sorts of things there. There may be, may be some hope though, there though that we may be able to develop our own virtual instruments that use the existing uh, proprietary instruments library. You've still got to buy them but at least it's getting us closer to the... Closer. There are some open sample libraries, particularly for instruments. Yeah, I've, 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 yeah I've, I've had a quick play with them and they're starting to sound good. But there are converters for, to convert to Linux sample format. Oh, cool. Okay. Like sound and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think we get close. It's by, it's by no means a, a lost a lost cause, but it's sort of I suppose what I've been trying to contrast in my mind is where where are these companies that are producing the proprietary tools putting their investment into, and invariably it is in that sort of yeah. yeah. That, and piano tech's both. Yeah, and, and thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah. So piano tech, which is a, is a modelled acoustic piano simulator, they actually do a Linux version which still works. Software. Still proprietary software. Where I think we have an opportunity though is, is something like a, a live performance host. So the main stage of software I showed 
earlier, I think may present an opportunity because it's a, a relatively smaller and easier chunk for us to bite off it potentially as a, a community. My thinking thus far is if we were to approach that, we'd, we'd tar probably target OS 10 in the first instance, simply because that gets, still gives you access to the existing set of libraries of both free and non-free uh, virtual instruments. But if we can make it as OS agnostic as possible, that would be, be a good result. Um, a few thoughts there on how, how we might be able to actually structure it technically. There's some, I did have a bit of a, a look around prompted by this talk to see what is, what's out there. And the, the uh, KX Studio Carlos software looks like it's fairly close to what we do, or what would be, what would be necessary. Um, it seems to me if we could write the code in such a way that the MIDI-only MIDI side of it could actually run on embedded hardware, that would be, that would be a win as well. I did want to mention too with the, in the, um, on the free software side of it, there is there's some really nice uh, tools for doing more electronic music style live performance, but this is a slight, seems to be a slightly different, a different solution space they're going for. Thank you. So um, some conclusions such that they are. So I think my, my sense so far from having poked at this is that it's going to be hard for us to, hard but not impossible for us to create credible virtual instruments, but I think there's plenty of edge cases around that we might, that we might be able to have, particularly in that sort of providing a host, a host of environment because that's mostly just good, good solid engineering, not, ex not a whole bunch of time spent optimising optimizing code. I'd be interested in collaborating or talking to others if there's anyone else who's sort of got similar sort of, a similar sort of bent or if I've missed something and actually there's this really great application here, you're an idiot, you've just waited 20, minute about, 20 minutes of our time because this is exactly the right piece of software already out, already out there. So, sorry. So I don't know that you've missed something, but I can see how you'd build something very close to that okay. on Linux yep. without much challenge. You know, something that hosted VSTs let you patch things together. Mm. But would, but do you get that sort of ability to change, also have scenes almost, I guess, as all the different patches as the tricky. That was the tricky bit. But it's certainly, certainly, certainly a conversation to have. Yeah, we can have a yeah. There was actually a commercial box available at one point that ran Windows VSTs under Wine yeah, that's as the, an embedded box. Yeah, okay. research, Muse Research Receptor, yeah. yeah. And it, work, it works it pretty well. It sort of worked until it went abandonware as yeah, well. Yeah, some of, it is somewhat um, abandonware. There's also, you mentioned many keyboards, most of the mixing desks these days all run Linux. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what, any other questions? Questions, comments? Um, so I guess my question is a little bit different in that um, I do uh, live sound reinforcement. Yep. Um, so I don't deal with the instrument side of things. Um, and traditionally, if you do an analog setup, you've got to buy a whole bunch of gear, many thousands of dollars, effects racks, all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking at cheaper ways to go about doing this. Now, Soundcraft have recently released uh, the UI 16, which yep. is a mixer with a HTML5 interface. Yep. Are you aware of any um, open source or um, accessible, more accessible solutions that do a similar sort of thing, um, so that you don't, if I, you know, if uh, features want to be added um, outside of what is provided with the box, mm. you can go about doing that, or you can engage somebody to do that for you. Yeah, I think I think I think there's certainly tools out there. So it would seem it seems to me that even some of the the very good digital audio workstation offerings, free like um, Ardor, thank you, um, is one that comes to mind. There's actually quite a good range of um, recording software and plugins to do that that are freely available. Paul, you might did you want to? Um, I assume Paul, you're answering the question. Um, I was going to add uh, for your interest. Um, LMMS is mm -hmm. a um, multimedia or sorry, software synthesis and sequencing. Yep. Uh, I know people use it live mm. because of its, um, you know, it, it, can't, it, it has uh, its own synthesis. It has Xenab sub yep. sub FX. Uh, it has VST plugin support, um, sound font support. Um, so I, I don't think it is answering that particular um, you know, patch set one yep. go 
patch set to go, that kind of thing. But uh, there's that certainly mm. that might provide a lot of the, that s similar integration for you. I, I was quite looking forward to this actually being my, one of my last bits of formal presentation for the for the conference and enjoying the rest. But I'm, I'm wondering, there might actually be worth running a boff on this. Is a sufficient interest some sort of combination of live sound and like maybe we'll, maybe we'll look at doing that because it's obviously more out there than, than I was aware of. Sorry, Steve. Um, the video the, <laughs> uh, the video hasn't gone online yet. I'll harass Steve Walsh about it. But a recent Canberra Linux user group talk had some rather good stuff from Martin Schwenke on a lot of these software yep. tools, like Arda that was mentioned, how yep. he uses it, and some of the issues with closed source and open source difference. Sure. Uh, so that video should go live maybe next week when Steve Walsh is back in camera, but that's a useful one to at least have a look at. Cheers. Yep. I'm, I'm very conscious on the last thing between you and lunch, so I, unless there's anything further, I'll thank you for your attention and look forward to, to solving you. some of these problems from here on in. <laughs>